Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Miami Basel, oh, Art Basel, Miami Beach. And I'm very excited and happy to welcome Michael Craig Martin and Norman Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Hello, Michael. Hello, you're very well, you're Hello, very well known in England, maybe not as well known in the United States, and at least in this part of the United States, as in my opinion you should be. Hmm? You are kind of American, you are Irish, you are British, and you were born in 1942 in Dublin. 41. 41 in Dublin, that makes you just one, even, even just slightly even older. older than me, but not very much. Hmm? And, but you've spent most of it, the fact is, though you studied in Yale, and that was a very formative part of your life, I think, studying in Yale. We'll talk about that later, doubtless. You've basically made your career in England. You're known as an artist, as a very significant artist, but also as a teacher, and as a teacher at a famous art school in England, Goldsmiths, which in its time produced the wonderful world of Damien Hirst and all his friends. But we're here to talk about you primarily as an artist, there's, uh, if you go outside, just outside this room here, there is a booth with, with uh, Alan Cristea, who is a print dealer, a print dealer of great distinction in England, who has produced a very beautiful series of prints, which is almost sold out, so you better hurry up. And we've decided to call it the Miami Suite, isn't that right? Just now. And also there is this wonderful book, which has been a huge success in England, called on being an artist, which uh, Michael is on sale outside after this, uh, you know, this, uh, the distributor, the American distributor is here, and Michael is going to sign copies of the, uh, to the, uh, of the book to those of you who are willing to purchase it. But to begin with, I think we're going to try and have a little bit of an exposition from Michael, maybe a little bit aided by myself, of Michael, the artist who has a 40-year career of, as I say, considerable significance. I remember myself when he showed this famous work, his famous depiction of an oak tree. No, this is not an oak tree. No, it had nothing to do with Constable. You will see what it is in a minute. Michael. So why don't we go through the slides? I may interrupt you because I always find it quite difficult not to interrupt. Hmm? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? It's hard for me to tell that you can hear me okay. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you for coming. Um, I, I feel I have to assume that certainly with anything early in my work, most people wouldn't know it because, my, because I've had my career in England. My early history is in England and is not widely known in America. So I, I wanted to start with some early things so as to give you a context for the things that I do now, so you get a picture of what it is that I have done over my uh, career. I finished, I was very, very lucky. Uh, I went to Yale in the early 60s. It was not only a fantastically good school, but I was, in that, in that way, artists are, can be, it's very, very important for an artist to have luck occasionally, and I had very good luck, which was that it was the best moment for Yale, and I was there when Chuck Close and Richard Serra and Bryce Martin were all there at the same time. But it doesn't, get, it doesn't really get better than that. And, but when I finished my course, I was invited to come. I needed a job to survive, and I was invited to come to England to teach in an art school. And I thought, well, I'll go for a year or two. And that was 50 years ago, and I haven't left yet. So, so things happen, things happen. And so what I want to do is, first of all, I just want to show you some, I'm, I'm showing you kind of one or two works a decade from the early decades. So there's dozens of works that you're not going to see, but it gives you some idea and also to give you an idea about how the interest that I have in the early work continues, although it takes many different forms, it takes a different form later in my work. So the first thing I want to show you, this is, a, this is from a, a sculpture. I started as a sculptor and uh, uh, this was from my first show, solo show in England. It was in 1969, and it was a set of works, all of which were based on boxes. My, there was, obviously there's a minimalist influence, 
but there's something else too, which is I always thought of minimalism as being a bit too pure for me. And one of the things that int interested me from the very beginning was the nature of, of function and how function determines what things look like. Everything we have in life, all the things around us, are all determined by what they need to do. That's why they look like they do. That's why they're made out of what they are. That's why they're the size that they are. And so this, this idea of functionality, which seemed to me that art in general ignored, that was what I wanted to focus on. So here we have a box. I like the idea of a sculpture you could put away. This is in its put away form. And then you, it has, oh, you could open and then open completely. Made of wood? It's made of plywood. Plywood. It's made of, made of plywood. And so the, uh, there were lots of things about it that I liked. I liked the idea, that, the idea that you could have a sculpture you could get rid of when you didn't want it, and also the idea that the, that the thing that you're most forbidden to do, which is to touch a work of art, was the thing that you absolutely had to do in order to actually see it. Of course, today, many of these works are in museums, and even I am forbidden from opening them. But the thought is there. Think of it as the thought. The thought is you there. Like the drawing aspect of it, in a strange way. Well, I, I was always very interested in uh, drawing. I did a lot of drawings of the of these kind of works, um, but 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 the drawing in the sense that I come to later was not part of this of the work of this time. It's really to do with the question of engagement, a direct self-conscious engagement of the viewer in the work itself. Okay. Now we're going up, we're skipping then. That's about four or five years anyway. This was a scandal. <laughs> well, it was too. In its it, way. In its way, yes. It, there were too few people to notice it to cause a big scandal, but um, it was a modest scandal. Um, and what I did was I took a glass of water, and when it was first shown, it was shown in my gallery in London. It was the only object in the gallery and it was on a glass shelf, and it's always shown nine feet high, so it's out of reach. Just a glass of water on the wall. Many people came to the gallery and thought they didn't see anything, and thought there was no show, and left quickly. Um, but with the, with the glass of water, it, uh, there was a text, and I wrote this text, which is, it's a discourse between but there's two voices, and one is the voice of the artist and the other the viewer. One is the voice of the believer, and the other is the skeptic. But you wrote both. But I, but it's you a play it's, both roles. I play both roles. And my thought was that when you read the text, you become both roles too. If you believe it, it's, you're doing it, and if you don't believe it, well, that's, that's your business. Okay? So this is, this is the text. And the text basically, you can, maybe you can read some of it, uh, basically what it says is I'm claiming that I have not changed the appearance of the glass of water in any way, and yet it's not a glass of water. I have turned it into an oak tree, despite appearances. It is not a glass of water at all anymore. It is actually an oak tree. And uh, obviously I'm, I'm playing with the relationship between the object, the viewer, the artist, between, and also the essential poetic aspect of art, which is belief. If you don't give yourself to a work of art, it doesn't work. You have to give yourself over to it. So you, it, it's, and so I've, I've tr what I tried to do was legitimize in the work both belief and skepticism. From your perspective, Michael, in this important work for you, in, in your history, how did you feel this was doing something that Duchamp hadn't done? Well, I f what Duchamp did with the ready-mades was to put something in just into an, uh, by putting something, uh, a ready-made object, an ordinary object, into the context of art, it would become art. And what I was trying to do was to take this a little bit further and say that even if you've done that, if you don't believe it to be a work of art, it isn't one. If without the belief, it doesn't properly function. And what do you, th I mean, how did that also relate to your Catholic upbringing and the idea of trans... Well, of course, for anybody who's a Catholic or was brought up as a Catholic, of course, we are touching on the question of uh, transubstantiation, which is the basis of the Mass, 
which is the, uh, the, the changing of the bread and wine. So if I hadn't been brought up as a Catholic, I would never have really understood the principle of transubstantiation. But then when I looked into it, it I discovered that transubstantiation is a very ancient belief and goes back, the, the Egyptians believed in transubstantiation too. Be, and so it's not simply a Christian belief, it was before that it was, an, it was an ancient belief. But it's one which doesn't exist in the modern world except in Catholicism. It's the, mo the one amazing exception in the, that, that there is this exceptionally strange belief but I imagine that, held by Catholics. But, but I imagine at the time that was not in your head. Can I assume that? Or was it only subliminal? No, no, no. I was very conscious of the fact that I knew. I was brought up too much as a Catholic. Anybody who's been to Catholic school, you never forget these things. And uh, I certainly knew what I... But when but, you were making this piece, was that in your mind? Well, I wasn't trying to do the same thing, but as soon as I thought of... I was trying to do something where... I, I did everything and nothing at the same time. And I thought the only way to do everything is to do nothing. And, that and then I realized that the one way to do that was to imply massive change without any change at all. And of course, none of you can prove I haven't done it. And I can't prove that I have. So we're even, you know, it's... I mean, before we go on, I'm going to ask, <clears throat> ask you a question which I think reflects on all your work, is the idea of how difficult is it to achieve real simplicity? Well, I, uh, obviously, uh, Norman, it's true that, my, I mean, part of my idea for this work and part of, I did this in the early 70s. At that time, there was an interest in, among many artists about what is the, what is the most basic level that artwork can get, get, be to, you know, in, in minimalism, there's an idea of trying to get to the most basic thing about uh, uh, the visual presence of an object. This is something that preoccupies a lot of, of minimalists and conceptualists. It's an idea from the 60s and the 70s. Today, people are not interested in this, but at that time, it was quite an important idea. And it was certainly in my mind of trying to find what is the bottom line, what is the absolute minimum thing. So I, met, so I thought, well, this is fantastic. I've done something which is massive, and I haven't had to do anything. So it's that so because that nuance between something between something total and something nothing is it's a very slight move and so all of my work and all the subsequent work should be seen uh, the reason i'm telling you all this about this early stuff is because people sometimes think that this stuff is conceptual and then when i go on to do other things it's less so but i don't see it like that i see what i'm doing now as deeply related all the ideas that are in the work now are latent in, or, 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 or explicit in these early things. As it were, outside the market, because it was a sort of unsellable thing, even like a lot of so-called conceptual art, whether it is or it isn't, we can debate, but the idea of many artists of that time was to make art that was, in a sense, we say, and it's kind of relevant to say that in the, in but, the context of a place like at, this. At, at the time I did it, I. Uh, when, you, when you went to the first exhibition, it doesn't happen anymore because it's got too complicated, but I just gave away the text. There was a little pamphlet, and you could take the text with you. So the thing that was most something was the part you got free. Anybody could get their own shelf and glass of water, and then they could do it. And I thought, well, I've made something that's also totally valueless. Um, in fact, it went, it, quite early on, in the, the mid-'70s, I had a tour of work in Australia, and I had... I had doubled the price of the, of the oak tree above any other thing I'd ever done, thinking that it really is immaterial. And the only work that sold in Australia was the oak tree, and it was bought by the National Gallery of Australia. So if you want to see the original, you have to go to, Mel to Canberra, uh, and which, which I thought was just amazing that they, uh, that they did, the director of the museum was interested in, and bought it, and he did, of course he did exactly the right thing. Um, Okay, so that so that's so this so I'm you uh, you can see the kind of ideas I have, and also I'm going from made objects like the boxes to found objects like the uh, ready-made objects like the glass, and, and I've done did other things. Okay, and then after I did this, it created a real dilemma for me because how do I proceed beyond this extremity, and can I achieve this level of absolute? purity again, and I decided I couldn't. So I decided I would leave it and I would start again. 
And so what I did was I started to make drawings. And I made drawings of single objects, the kind of objects I'd been using before, I started to make drawings of them. These and are I, wall drawings? They weren't, initially they were just drawings. I just, and I drew, I, I, drew on, I drew everything on a sheet of paper this size. I always had a pad the same size. I drew every object from life and I drew it directly on the, on the paper to fill the size of the paper. It was the biggest I could get it. And uh, so, that a, so that a table would fill the, the thing or a safety pin both would fill the page. So the two objects, the drawings would be, the objects wouldn't be the same size, but the drawings would be. And I, and then I wanted them, I, you see, I didn't really set out to make drawings at all. I thought I was, would use found drawings because I'd used found objects. And then I went looking for drawings like this, and to my amazement, they didn't exist. Everywhere I looked, you think they exist, you all think they exist, you go looking for them, the only place you can find them is in my work. I make all these drawings because there are no drawings like this. Very straightforward drawings, no funny business, they're not cartoons, I don't exaggerate anything, I don't, I don't distort anything, I just draw the thing straightforwardly in front of me. And I decided that I wanted to remove my own hand because I wanted the drawings to have the character of the mass-produced objects that I was drawing. So I wanted the drawings to have that, that sense of impersonality and mass production that the objects have. Yet, on the, yet at the same time, even now, they look like your work. So in that sense, they are not impersonal drawings. At the, at the time, I thought uh, my intention was to make a styleless drawing. The irony is that, oh, I've done it for so long, it's become my style, and this is now how everybody recognizes that it's mine, which is instantly recognized because I'm the only person who does this. And, but I thought at the time I was making a drawing that had no style at all. And so I'm showing you these because this is the kind of objects that I drew in the beginning. And then I'll just show you something else, which I, I started the drawings in 1978, and I draw Every year I draw, sometimes do 50 drawings in a year and sometimes I do five. I'm adding all the time. So I have great waves of things I suddenly become interested in. I use, and, I, and once I've made a drawing, I use it again and again and again. I use, it, oh, I use it in paintings, I use it in prints and drawings. I use it for installations, I use it many times. So I've built a vocabulary of hundreds and hundreds of these, of these drawings. These object now, drawings, largely. Object and the idea the idea was that each one I just did this drawing of an object and in order to make them to get them as accurate and impersonal as I could the pencil was too personal so I I had discovered a kind of tape which is made out of crepe paper which curves it's designed to curve it was made for the electronics industry in the 60s and so everything you see is drawn with tape and the uh, the tape comes minutely thin up to half an inch, three quarters of an inch thick. So if I want to do something big, I use the tape on the wall. If I want to do something thin, I do it on the, on the page. And I did the first drawings. Each one, I traced it onto acetate. So now I have clear sheets of acetate with images on them. Now, I'm showing you this. This, this is an old, obviously an old drawing. You remember the telephones when they look like that? And now we have the iPhone. And because I wanted to say something else, which is that I have drawn these, ob I've drawn, drawn the things around me for whatever it is, 35, 40 years, and objects have changed. They've changed very dramatically over the time, and I've recorded that change without even thinking that I was doing, I didn't set out to do that, but the objects keep changing. I'm only interested in new things. I'm not interested in antiques. I only draw new things, and I want them to be ordinary things, so they have to be things that everybody recognizes. If you can't recognize it, I can't draw it. it does, my work doesn't work. So are there, are there 40 years between these two drawings? About 30, 40 years, yeah. It's a, it's a bit of time. Well, but you see, what's, very, what's also very interesting about this is the, the, the drawing of the object from the 70s. You remember the telephone like that? You picked it up like that. There was a handle. And there was a thing you went like that. And then there was the bit that you listened to. And there was the other bit. You, and, you, and they were exactly the right distance apart. Right? It, was, it all worked perfect. It was form follows function. That was the 20th century design mantra, and nearly everything of that period could, could be seen in terms that what it looked like would explain what it did. It's a very beautiful concept. Okay, and well, now... Who invented that uh, expression, form follows function? 
Is it Neutra? It might, it might, be, it might be Le Corbusier. Or, yeah. I'm not sure. It's probably some architect. But, it's a, but it's, a, it's a very good, clear 20th century thought about design. Now we move into the, the 21st century, and you can see so you have the iPhone, it does 25 different things. It takes pictures, it's a computer, it gives you the internet, it gives you the, your calendar, your diary, everything you want, it's all in there. And the only thing it doesn't show you is where do you speak and where do you listen? You don't even know where to find these things <laughs> on it. They're so it well, they're so, it just does it. And it doesn't look like any of the things that it does. So, and when I say that things look like what they do, what their function is, the only reason why the iPhone looks like that is the one thing it needs to do is give you the biggest screen surf surface it can that you can fit in your pocket. And that's why they look like this. And the other telephone, you would never get that into your pocket, but you didn't expect to. So, th so, this, so this is the kind of thing that's happening. Right now I'll show you the work. The, I never considered the individual drawings as, as the work. They were a tool. So to, that ex so to that extent, sorry, did somebody say something? Yeah. Oh, sorry? Didn't quite get that. Louis Sullivan. Louis, Louis Sullivan. Sullivan. Oh, I see, you found out who Louis, says. Yeah, see, the, but oh, it's Louis Sullivan yes, who you says. Yes, you see, the internet is... So the you internet can find is, out straight away. Yes, Wikipedia and, and Google are with Hello, us. Wiki, eh? Okay. Louis Sullivan, Very good, the but that's exactly, modern architect. That's it. There, there it is. And so, but, so, this is, so what happened was... I was doing these drawings and I would draw them and then I'd throw them on the floor and then I said there were piles of them and they were, they were, you could see through the acetates and then I started to make wall drawings. I started to make drawings out of drawings and then I made slides of the drawings, projected them on the wall any size I wanted and then made the same drawing in tape, just a bigger tape, directly on the wall. And this is now, this is the, from the first show of those which was 78. So this is show you, this is how they started. Now this. 10 years of this, okay? So I'm going to show you two. And there's, a, there's another one. Now, in some of the, for in the, in the first one, the drawings are transparent to each other. In the second one, they are opaque to each other. Well, I did that just by removing lines for, for the overlap. So I'm, what, I've tr what I tried to do in the drawings was to imitate uh, structures, constructions in art, still lives, group photographs, uh, various ways and things looking like they're flying through the air, things that are by, simply by the way in which I constructed the drawings out of the other drawings. Was there, how much chance was involved in these, as it were, compositions? It depends on what you mean by, what, by what's a chance. I never thought... In the Cajun sense. I never, I never was... I, I, I always... I'm not a narrative artist. I have no interest in narrative. And so I try to avoid narrative. The thing about you all is that you are really interested in narrative. All of us are, we're narrative makers. And when we see things, we are uncomfortable without narrative. We, make, we want it to make sense, we want it to make a story, we want them to fit together, we want them to say, they want, so I put things together and you do the rest of working out what, what, what you make of this. I once, I once had a woman say to me that she, she really liked this work and she understood everything except the ice tray. I've never figured out what she meant by that. So let's, let's look at this drawing a little bit more carefully. I mean, you decided to put all these things together? Yes. And course. it was a kind of, is it to you funny? Is it witty? Is it just chance? Is, is, is there a story? I mean, when you got up, but I say, how I, long did it take you to make, as you oh, were to put this? Can you kind of... No, I have no idea. I, no, but I, it's, a, it's a composition. I, I made the globe. And, and, of course, the globe is such an interesting object because, like the book, has no words in it. You don't need words to say it's a book. The globe, you can draw a globe and you don't need the map. The only thing that makes a globe make sense is having the map on it. But if you want to draw a globe, you don't need the, the map to, in order to be able to draw a globe. So lots of things, it's possible to leave out very important information. No and words there's, on the book. There's also a very, very important thing about these drawings. These very simple drawings. And you, the same is true when, you get, when we get to my paintings. When I show you something like this, I am not telling you 
what is the size of this object? What is this object for? I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you what it's made out of. I'm not telling you what it looks like from the other side. And yet, you know, everybody in this room knows all of those things. I haven't told you anything. These drawings are so simple that all this information is in your memory. You know all of this. And when you look at my drawing, you see, I, the reality is there is no globe here in the room. I'm sorry to tell you, but there's, just like there's no, uh, no oak tree, there is no globe here. Drawings allow the experience. This is the miracle of what we do with our eyes. We are, we are picture reading pe uh, creatures. Dogs cannot read pictures. Dog, you, you put a dog in front of the TV, they don't get it. So that's because, you, so that's because they can't read an image. We, the, and the image reading is our great, it's our, our most basic and most important gift. Michael, I have to interrupt again. I mean, would you describe this as a pictogram in any sense? A complex no, I, no, pictogram? No, it's a picture. It's a picture. Yes. And a there picture. is a distinction between a picture and a pictogram. Well, I would say a pictogram was something to derive from a picture. A pictogram is something that's moving towards towards language. If you go back to all the ancient languages, if you go back to ancient Chinese, if you go back to ancient Egyptian, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, that it, we are t they, the it lang written language starts with pictures. In the caves, they didn't write sentences on the walls; they drew pictures. It's more basic than than reading and writing. Is what we do with our eyes and our. Uh, we have this amazing ability to be able to conjure the presence of something, the sense of the experience of something, without the presence of the object itself. But even you, and certainly the audience, when they look at this picture now, sorry, but if they look at it now, and even you looking at it now after 30 or 40 years, will, as it were, supply a kind of curious narrative to this, won't you? Well, I... My instinct is not to, but I do know that other people do, and I think I'm not trying to resist. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do this. I think it's perfectly reasonable that people do that. It's just that it's the, if you try to do that, the narrative will carry to a certain point, then it will fail because there isn't a strict narrative. But where is the central aesthetic moment for you? I don't know what that means, Norman. You don't you? No, no, no idea. No. Well, we'll discuss that later. Okay. But I mean, where is the aesthetics? Where, where, where does it? Where does the well, satisfactory, where does the pleasure lie? But normally, I surely that's... I mean, in, I think it is. It's hugely it's pleasurable. In the, it's, in the, it's in the eye of the viewer. I mean, obviously, I have created a composition with a group of objects circling a globe. And there's a kind of, there's a kind of implicit space which is the equivalent of a naturalistic space, even though the objects are not natural. The objects in individually are naturalistic, but their relationship, because of their scale, is not. I think we should move okay, on. Okay, let's move on. Uh, now we're jumping ahead. This, the, the last one was 1982, and now we're in about 1994, so I've left out a little bit here. Okay. Because what happens in, in the, the, the round the 93, 94, was, I, just, I, was in, I was doing an exhibition in a gallery and I suddenly had this idea of painting the, the room, painting the walls. I've been doing black and white wall drawings for 10 years and, I, and suddenly I have this idea I'm gonna paint the room. So I, I painted, and th this is actually the second, but I kind of took, second exhibition, but I took hold of it. This was in Paris in 94. I had a gallery, you know, in Paris there's these beautiful courtyards, but, lots of little rooms around it. The gallery had seven rooms. I painted every room a different, vibrant color. I thought, what colors am I going to use? Red, blue, yellow, green, just like the objects. If you can't name it, I don't use it, okay? And then I painted each room a different color, and then in each room, on the wall, I painted two objects, life-size and kind of naturalistic. You can see they're about the right size. They're, you know, there's a little canvas with the back of a canvas here. There's the filing cabinet, rather old-fashioned filing cabinet there. There were two objects in, in every room. And the, the impact was so enormous, I just couldn't believe it. People came to the gallery and they were just amazed by how exciting it was because it was like walking into a painting and people could, could their, their, people's uh, emotion was so charged by this, by the amount of the color and by the intensity of it and the pleasure of going from room to room. So, to be honest, I never went 
back. Uh, that was you never absolute, lost color. I never lost color. After that, I knew I was on to something. And then that led to uh, uh, many, many, many essays. Nearly all of them were done in Europe. I did about 23 different installations uh, in various places in the world. Uh, this is just a time, th this was a giant uh, museum in Hanover in Germany in which there were 15 rooms and they were all different colors and there were giant objects. In each room. So, so here I've moved on a bit. Now I'm having the, I'm, I'm, I've ch I'm playing with the scale of the objects so they're no longer naturalistic, naturalistic in size. They can be gigantic or tiny. And I'm also using the kind of color that I was using in the walls. Now I'm using it in the objects themselves. And this is an uh, installation in, uh, in Valencia, Valencia, in Valencia in Spain. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Velázquez painting Las Maninas. I would hope everybody. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, we, we will hope everybody. But if you are, uh, it's my ver it was because I was in Spain, it's my version of Las Maninas. Uh, the canvas is the artist's canvas. The, um, the fire extinguisher is the artist. The sunglasses is the princess. The, ro the belt is the dog. The pencil sharpener is the dwarf, and then there's the ladder at the back of the man coming through the doorway, and the mirror, which is on the back of the wall. So, and the canvas. So, it, so it's a kind of version of, a, of an old master. And so tell me, let's go back. I mean, do you, the, obviously these things are temporary, on the whole temporary. Have any of these things, do any of these things survive? Uh, some things uh, survive. I've become very skeptical about permanent, permanent things. About half the things that I've done, which were called permanent, no longer exist. Somebody buys the building, somebody tears it down, somebody changes the use. I, and you're philosophical I once, I once, about that. I once did something on, in a, on the windows, of a, a, in gold leaf on the windows, and uh, for, the, for somebody for a building, and then the first client came in and took a razor blade to it the first day and scraped it all off. So, what, you, you know. You have to take it. You have to take it with a pinch of salt. I think with these things. I think I have some things which I've made out of materials which are which are intended to last, and I think they will. But in general, you cannot be sure. A lot. I mean, I also have to say it's very important in doing giant things. I like doing giant projects. I love painting whole galleries, take over the whole place. It's absolutely wonderful to me. But you can't do that if it's going to be permanent. People do not let you have a museum permanently to yourself. So if, they you did in the 18th do, century. if you want to do it, you have to be able yeah. to do it in a way that's feasible in, as, a, as a temporary operation. All the colors that I usually use, except in this one actually, but in general, I use ordinary wall paint to paint the walls. They, they're colors that you can get from you know, normal manufacturers. I use projectors, this, all these modern devices, the tape, all these things allow you to do something elaborate quickly. I've, in all the big projects I did, I spent about a week with, with about five assistants doing it, and then we were totally exhausted and needed hospitalization, and, 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 and I could not have gone on for another day or two, and they'd have all quit. So there's a kind of psychological as well as physical limit for doing these things. I'm, just, I'm showing you this one because I've also done things outdoors. Which uh, This was a gallery in England in a place called Milton Keynes. Um, this, it's, you can only just tell in this picture, but I actually, I use very, very expensive acrylic paint from Switzerland. It's the most wonderful paint in the whole world, and it is very expensive. And I convinced the manufacturer of the paint to supply the paint, to paint the entire exterior of the building, all four sides in this pink. And I can tell you, even when it was dark, this paint <laughs> was <laughs> The building glowed in the dark. And does it survive? It does not survive. No. How long was it there for? Well, it was there for about four years. That's not bad. That's not bad. And uh, and it you know, but it, it was really uh, it, no one had ever seen a building like that because nobody uses a material of that quality on the exterior of a building. It you you can't do that normally because it just so, because the expense in paint is pigment, and so it. It's unlikely, to, I'm unlikely to have the opportunity again, but it was nice to, to Maybe do Maybe somebody in Miami will ask you to do something you never, like this. You, ne you never know if anybody's listening. Um, but, and also, I mean, and then I, take, I, I, of I often try to take one object. So for the, for the gallery, I painted just the empty drawer. I thought the idea of an empty drawer is very like what a museum is. 
It's a kind of empty receptacle. You put things into it. It changes depending on what goes into it. So, that, so it becomes a kind of symbol for the, for, for the place. Um, this, this is show you that I used, I've used other material, many other different kinds of materials Beyond too. Mm -hmm. This is a neon drawing. This is, I mean, I, I, it's about eight stories high. Um, uh, this is in, in Bregenz in Austria. It's a, a, uh, an art museum uh, there. And the, the whole of the outside is made out of frosted glass. And I had the neon drawing placed just inside the neon glass so that in the daytime it would disappear. And at the night when you put it on, this giant light bulb would, li would light up. I don't, know if, I don't know whether I'm going fat, too fast or too slow. Am I, is it all right? It's fine. It's it's all, we're all right? So okay. here we have, as it were, a separated now we're, now, Yes, well, now we're, in, now we're in with, with painting. And the thing that's unusual in the body of my work is usually people start with painting and then go on to do other, more different things. My work is completely backwards. I start with all the other stuff, and I gradually come to painting. If the, the paintings came out of painting rooms. It was how can I make an object that I can work on longer, that I, can, that I don't have to, it does not have to be temporary, that I can spend the time I want, that I can do in different sizes. How can I, do, how can I make it a studio practice? And so, that, and so gradually what I've done is, try to, is, is create a, a, a practice of painting, and that's what I'm going to show you. Now, this is one of the earliest paintings. And you can see this painting, this painting is really, it's a painting about space. The, um, if you, there's the, the, the smallest objects are in the front, the middle sized objects in the middle, and the little objects, the, the big objects the, 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 uh, the big objects in the back. But the big objects are small because, it's in, because the rules of perspective is that that's the way it works. It, it, it goes, the things at the, at the bottom of the picture look like they're in the front, and the things at the top of the picture look like they're in the back. And, but, when I'm, but actually, all of these objects are not touching. They're all on the surface. There's, there is no space in this painting. So there's a, it's a kind of play about what is the reading of space within... There is, there within, is a space the and there isn't. There is and there is, and it is. And the space that you think there is is not quite the space. Each object is containing its own perspective. I draw each object in perspective, but the objects are not in a common perspective. They each have an individual one. Okay. And then we see a, this is a very different kind of composition, a very different kind of space, something much more dynamic. And again, like the wall drains where the, where the objects overlap, there's bigger plays of scale, and I'm, I'm playing with things that are floating. But when we discussed this painting yesterday, you said this was not in any sense a surrealistic painting. When I looked at the drawing pin, at the pin, as it were, getting going into the uh, a grotesque, I mean, a, a rather unlikely, unlikely uh, safety pin being stuck into a pail of water, apparent pail of water. Obviously, you lead too modest a life, Norman. Not <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I know I, I'm trying all the time to touch on all the conventions of picture making, and some of those conventions. Create, or surre create surrealism. Some of those conventions create Bosch and Bruegel. Some of them create Vermeer, and uh, some of them create Piero. Matisse and Piero. I'm playing, I'm, and I'm, uh, uh, sometimes I have things that re reference uh, minimum, because all artists have played with these same things, and I'm trying to play with them in my, within, your within, own the, language. within my own language. I've created a language which, uh, which allows me an extraordinary, degree, to me, an extraordinary freedom, freedom of play, yes. Uh, then in the, about the last uh, seven or eight years, I started to do sculptures. Uh, the sculptures are, uh, they're not really sculptures of objects, they're sculptures of drawings. The sculptures are completely flat. The, um, the sculpture is only, you know, uh, three quarters of an inch uh, wide. If you, if you stand on the side, it's just a straight line. It's, and so although they are three-dimensional objects, they are, they're, they're, the way in which you read them is a two-dimensional reading. It's a three-dimensional object where the illusion is a two-dimensional illusionism. And also there is, of course, the wit of a drawing 
a sculpture as a drawing. Sculpture as a... Because usually it's the other way around. Oh, exactly. And, then the, and the thing that was the breakthrough for me about how to do this was the realization that, if I, that it takes a lot... It's made out of steel. It looks very light, but in fact it's very heavy. I need it, it needs to be supported. The whole of the support system is buried in the ground, and you just put the grass back over it, and suddenly the thing looks like it's just hovering on the, on the grass. Could you imagine a, making a sculpture of a man holding the umbrella or Certain, a lady in the shoe? Certainly not. Because <laughs> there are no figures in your... There are you're not interested in the human figure at all, as far as I know. I, uh, I think of everything I do, uh, everything I do is based on its relationship to a person, and the person is the viewer. I don't make the picture of the viewer. The viewer is the, the, is the figure. The objects don't make sense except in relation to the figure. They make sense in relation to so you. So the viewer is, uh, can imagine something. picking up this umbrella, which Well, you will, can course, see that it's a you know, gust of wind and it's going into the lake. I mean, you know... I have to say, this is, I had this fantastic sculpture exhibition in England at uh, Chatsworth House in these beautiful, um, fabulous gardens with the house, you can see the house behind. Um, very, the most ideal place, obviously, for these kind of works. And then there's, you know, there's, there's something very nice about this one, about the drawing going into the, oh. going in, go, going into the ground. So the, the fork, oh. so the fork, oh. as though the fork is a real fork. And so, there's, I, obviously, I enjoy those, those, those ways in which mm, reality and, um, and illusion collide with each other. Now, yes, now, now I'm sure you... Now we're coming um, to your paint. Ten minutes. Okay, I'm, now I'm going to really, really... Now we're going to run. I'm going to really, really fast because I want to be able to let you ask some questions. I'm just going to show you, this is re very recent work. Okay, these are recent paintings. Okay, this is an exhibition of new paintings that was in China this year. This is an exhibition of paintings in Krefeld in Germany this year. And this is an exhibition that I have on right now in London at the Serpentine... Called Transients. Called Transients, which is about the change that I showed you with the two phones of going from, what, from analog to digital. This is what the show is about. Gives you also a sense of scale, which is very important in Michael's work. And then you see a wall drawing plus older paintings. Some of them are old and some of them are new. And that's the new sculpture for the, for the exhibition. Uh, and that's it. And now, if anybody had any questions. <laughs> I think it was good like that. Thank you. Is it all right? Yeah. Okay, first of all, congratulations on your show at Serpentine. Thank you. And um, so you have all these drawings that, in seeing them, they kind of describe to the viewer what they are and what they do, like you were saying. If, and art is this very ambiguous thing, so if you had to make a drawing of art that would describe to the viewer that it is art, what would you draw? Well, I, don't, I don't know how to answer your question, really. But, I, but, but uh, one of the things that I try to do, a lot of art seems to me, this is very personal, but I think it's, it, kind, it, it, it avoids explicitness. There's a very big avoidance of, I am so explicit. I don't leave you any room for doubt here. I give you, if I say it's pink, it's pink. If I say it's a book, it's a book. You're not, we're not testing the water to see how you think it is, okay? And I have this idea that it's a little bit like, you know when you say a word over and over and over again, it starts to become meaning, <laughs> meaningless. I think the, the subject matter is so explicit in what I do, I think it's quite important to be able to lose it. I'm trying to lose it. The work is moving towards this kind of abstraction. That's where the work is taking me. I'm just following this work. You can see I've done that over a long period of time. It's unfolded. I don't have a plan. I've never had a plan. I do what comes next. And it's taken me in this route, and I think, but I, that's how I see where the, the thing, and to me, the objects, people, very often people look at my work, the one they want is based on the object. I like that object, so I want that work. 
I never see the object. I think I like that picture, but I don't like that one. That's what I was saying about simplicity, and I suppose the essence, isn't it? Yes, I, there is an essence to what Michael is trying to achieve within his own very clearly defined language, which somehow has come about. Hmm? Any other like every artist, every artist, I mean, in the end, has his language. Jack. Do you know Jack Tilton? Um, Jack? Some people call you the father of the young YBAs. Uh, could you comment on any of your students at the time? Uh, well, I, I was teaching for a very long time, um, from 1966. The, the, the YBAs, the, the famous exhibition that they did was 1988, uh, when Damien Hirst curated the first exhibition, I and mean, when they were still students. Um, uh, if you're teaching art, of course, uh, one would like your, art, your students to be successful. You'd like them to be able to be artists. And that's what I meant by success. It never occurred to me fame and money. I just thought, like me at the time, to, the privilege of being an artist is one of the world's greatest privileges. And you don't have to be to make a fortune to do that. You don't have to be famous. Some people are, but not for, that's not true of everybody. And there's lots of people who go to art school. Art school is a fabulous thing to do, in my belief. And it doesn't matter whether you become an artist or not, because it's always going to be useful. Anybody who's been to art school, is, I can't imagine anybody regretting it, because it's a, the most useful thing about knowing about yourself and how to act in the world. Now, what happened in the late 80s at Goldsmiths, I became aware that I had more good students. I never taught without having good students, ever, anywhere. But I had more than I'd ever had before. And I tried to connect them with each other. I put them in seminars together, get them to see each other's work, get them to talk to each other. They became very familiar. There was a kind of chemistry about them. It was, it was partly me. It wasn't all me. I had a role, but I couldn't make it happen. But there were, say, 15 students. I went back oh, recently oh, in Freeze, and out of the students who were in this student exhibition, and they were all undergraduate students, Damien went, was, in his, was a second year undergraduate, went back to Goldsmiths to finish his third year after Freeze, and they, uh, out, of, out of something like 18, 15 of them are world famous. It's something astonishing. Nothing ever like that ever happened to me. If I could make that happen again, I'd make it happen every year. But I don't know how to, how to do. I don't know how to do it. Anyway, Michael has said that he's in a sense he's had two professions, and they're in a sense they're related but different, aren't they? He is an artist, and he is, has been a very very effective teacher. But we're here to discuss him. He is. Yeah, but, I, but I don't. But I don't, I don't mind that. I mean, I do. No, it's I do. Wonderful. No, but, but I think. I think of my. I, I think of everything I do as an extension of the same thing. I teach exactly, the, I'm talking to you, you can hear me talking is me making the pictures. You must be able to tell that when you hear me. It's the same voice, right? When I'm teaching, that's the same voice. I'm the same person in that. And I got that from going to Yale with Joseph Albers because Albers was unbelievably good at creating a, a, a kind Ambience. of umbrella of, int of a kind of understanding of things which applied to everything he touched. And that was my model as an artist. Does that make sense? Sir. You more talked about Hans Albers. Albers. Could you please say more how he was teaching? I mean, it's uh, obviously there are very few records. Even thought there was an exhibition in Berlin about it, but you didn't kind of hear much. So okay. it's interesting to hear firsthand well, yeah, okay. about how he was teaching. Okay. Now I have very, very good news for you. There's a great deal about this in this very, this e wonderful this book. very easy to purchase book, which I will sign. I talk a lot about Albers, about, and I, I felt very strongly about it because I felt nobody properly recorded what happened when I was a student. There's a lot about me, my teaching, and a lot of, but a, a great deal of it, a surprising even to me, amount of it was uh, to do with Albers and with Yale. And essentially, I mean, uh, it, was, it, 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 was a, it was a very, very important form of visual education. I believe passionately in visual intelligence. Albers taught a form of visual intelligence. It's not the same thing as literary intelligence. It's another thing. And some people have it and some people don't. It's learnable, it, just like anything else. But, it, but it, uh, it, you have to develop it. And Albers' whole idea of teaching was developing visual intelligence. Not just color. 
not, oh, certainly not just Colin, no. Yes? I can't hear. Thank you. Can you just say something about the challenges you faced when you coordinated the, uh, the summer exhibition? Well, of the for, Royal Academy. For, for anybody who knows the summer exhibition of the Royal Academy, it is a, a slightly ludicrous operation where it is a 100% open submission. Anybody can submit something. Uh, there are about 1,200 works go on the wall in the one exhibition, many by people who have never made a work by art before in their life. There are 13,000 works submitted, which are gone through by a jury, and a selection is made, and about 1,200 end up on the wall. Plus, there's the people who are, who, who are the members of the academy, they get to have six works each, and then there are guest artists. So it's a, it's a, it's a hopelessly complex menage of things. And what I tried to do was to create some kind of structure. Ambience as well. Well, a structure. I, it needed a structure. So I, I used color to, pay, to differentiate rooms. I, I tried to, my, my, I took every criticism I make every year and I tried to answer it. My greatest criticism was every room is the same. You go from this room and go with Godger to another room and it's, it's more stuff floor to ceiling and then you go to another room, it's the same thing. I just tried to make each room feel different. I took a lot of interest in having those very long views. I always put a major thing at the end of every long view, so you had a viewpoint when you're looking, things like that. But it was mainly to do with a kind of structuring of things. And then I invited 20 really interesting artists. Speaking as somebody who has worked at the Royal Academy for 30 years, I can say that Michael is the first and probably will be, for the foreseeable future, the last person to make somehow an acceptable cultural event, to put it like that, out of the summer exhibition of the Royal Academy. And congratulations to him. One more question over here, and then I might have a clap. Yes, a uh, question for the conceptual artist. Is there a place where a house would be uh, possibly turned into a piece of art by the artist and sold uh, with its contents, possibly with the presence of the artist? What a very good idea. Why don't we speak about that later? <laughs> I assume it's a commission. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, very, thank you very, very much. I just want to say finally one thing. I think that Michael is an artist who's f somehow fallen in terms of critical understanding and between, the, as it were, the worlds of Europe and America, between Britain and America, and I think he deserves an America to be far better known. As you can hear from his voice, he is also an American, and much of his culture comes from America. He's brought a great deal to British art through his art and through his teaching, and I think he needs to be far, far better known in the United States of America.